Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Good morning. And for those in the later time zone, good afternoon. Welcome to our Climate Action Plan webinar featuring Professor Maria Zuber. It's recording. Oh. And sponsored by MIT's Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network and the Alumni Association. My name is Jim Hamilton. I'm a member of the network, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Now, we are gathered here today in response to an email survey that we sent to interested alumni back in the spring. And from that survey, you all identified MIT's Climate Action Plan as a particular area of interest. You also indicated that webinars were an effective way to communicate with you. So the combination of your interests and chosen vehicle for communication precipitated today's discussion. To that end, we are delighted to have with us today Professor Maria Zuber, Vice President of Research, who will lead today's webinar on MIT's Climate Action Plan. Dr. Zuber is the Institute's point person for the Climate Action Plan, and we are, looking, we are all looking forward to hearing today what she has to say. Following Dr. Zuber's talk, we have some time for questions from the webinar participants. So to ask a question, simply type in your question at the bottom of the webinar page. I will see these questions in real time, and these will form the basis for our discussion following the presentation. Finally, just a quick thank you to the fellow members of the EES network who helped make this happen. Sarah Simon, David Dam Lure, Rajesh Kastaranagan, and Quentin Zondervan, as well as Lady Cabral from the Alumni Association. And a final thank you to two founding members of the network, Bruce Anderson and Natalie Givens, who I believe are joining us today from DC. Again, thank you all for being here today, and now I'll turn it over to Professor Zuber for her thoughts on the MIT Climate Action Plan. Professor Zuber. Okay, thank you. Uh -oh. All right, um, thank you for all, um, let's see, tuning in. I'm getting some reverberation here, so. Can you tell Jim to turn down his volume? Okay. Okay, so let's start. Um, the scientific evidence is clear. Okay, the Earth has warmed about degrees since the dawn of the industrial age. Uh, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 is greater than at any time during the last 800,000 years, which is the period of time over which we have um, data collected. Uh, human activity is responsible for most present-day climate change. We don't know the exact amount, but we certainly know plenty um, to demand that we take uh, action. The impacts of climate change include rising sea levels, flooding, droughts, wildfire, ocean acidification, and other factors which we can't begin to comprehend uh, because we are traveling in uncharted territory, because there has never been a point in recorded human history where we have had this much carbon dioxide in the air. Um, and this problem is uh, only getting worse. Uh, with the developing world um, having a need and a desire uh, for greater energy, which has actually fueled the economic competitiveness and lifestyle in the developed world, um, there's a, a great deal of interest from developing countries to uh, increase their use of energy, which uh, is basically driven by fossil fuels uh, in the present day. Okay, in, in um, the COP21 conference last year, um, we had nearly 200 countries um, that all agreed that we need to act to limit warning, warming um, to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, actually, they um, they had a desire to limit warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, this is an exceedingly, exceedingly challenging goal. Okay, um, but the the consequences of inaction um, are potentially 
catastrophic. All right, so um, so what did we what are we doing on campus? So let me give you a little bit of the history. Um, we had a, a petition driven by a, a student group, Fossil Free MIT, asking us to divest from the top 200 fossil fuel companies. Um, students went to see President Reif um, with their petition um, and asked him to divest. Uh, the president said, don't come and tell me to do something. Um, we have a broad campus community and a broad alumni base. and um, and let's talk about what MIT ought to do about climate change and let's hear what everybody in our community thinks and um, and we should be addressing the entire climate change problem um, of which divestment could be one of the things that uh, that is discussed but not the only thing that's discussed so um, so uh, he initiated uh, a campus conversation on climate change that was to last for a year. Actually, it really wound up lasting about uh, um, a year and a half uh, um, until we announced our climate action plan. Um, in, um, in May of last year, uh, we announced uh, our environmental solutions initiative, and um, uh, which uh, is uh, a cross-school initiative on campus to um, address uh, the environment, including climate, but not limited to climate. Um, so we, we have long had um, actually a great deal of work going on on campus um, on the environment, uh, considerable work going on within our energy initiative on emissions, um, but we realize that there, there's a lot going on with the Earth's environment that isn't covered um, within the auspices of what was happening under the energy initiative and that we um, that we needed uh, another organization to um, to complement the important work that uh, that mighty was doing on um, on uh, carbon emissions um, so in um, in September of 2014 um, we uh, we kicked off the, the campus conversation and um, and we assigned um, a, uh, a, a group, a faculty, student, staff uh, group to um, uh, lead and plan out the conversation. Um, this conversation consisted of a number of elements. It had uh, an idea bank where people could put in their ideas. It, uh, it had a variety of town meetings. Uh, it had um, uh, a number of talks. Um, and um, and uh, there were abundant opportunities for um, for people in the MIT community to um, to provide input um, on their uh, ideas about what MIT should be doing on climate. It was a uh, I would say it was a broadly engaging and a respectful um, conversation. Uh, so we had a the the group. Um, submitted uh, a report to us uh, at the um, at the uh, end of uh, the academic year so that was in June 2015 and um, and so when we received the report with a a list uh, actually a long list of possible recommendations of what MIT could do um, to address climate change um, we released that report to the community and um, and got their feedback. Um, uh, we received feedback um, for several months. We closed. We had a 30-day uh, feedback period, um, but we uh, we shut down the email address then to provide feedback, and then people started um, emailing the president, me directly, and continued the feedback. And um, and then in um, in October of last year, we uh, we released a report with uh, with our plan for action um, on climate change, and um, and also um, just before we released that report, um, we um, we uh, 
we started off our environmental solutions initiative and it was led by Susan Solomon who was an extremely eminent climate scientist on our campus. Um, she did uh, a great deal of work in setting the academic tone and also working very hard on uh, educational aspects and uh, she wanted to get back to her research and teaching and so um, at about the time we released our climate action plan, Professor John Fernandez, uh, who is a building technology professor, um, uh, then took over and he is the current director of ESI. Okay, so um, so the, the core of the plan, um, the, uh, I, I think if, if one had to use the, uh, uh, the a very short tagline of what MIT's action plan is, it's uh, all hands on deck. Um, MIT is a, is a great institution, um, but climate change is a global problem that affects everybody and no one single institution um, has the ability to really move the needle. Um, and uh, it was our idea that we needed academia, industry, and government working together to address climate change. Um, and um, and uh, that, uh, the we, that our uh, our approach was going to be to engage as many sectors as we could. So, um, so we uh, we took a very proactive view that we needed to imagine the future that we wanted to live in, um, that includes an optimal energy mix. Uh, figure out what that uh, optimal energy mix is, and then think about incentives that would be required to um, to achieve that future, and to think about uh, focusing and accelerating. Um, research and development to achieve success. Okay, there are uh, five pillars to the Climate Action Plan. Um, first is uh, we need to improve our understanding of climate change. Um, we, um, the, the Earth's climate is extremely complex. Uh, it is a co complex system and um, and, and that's the basic reason um, why we don't have a, a full understanding of, um, of what the effects are of a continued emission of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, and we need to study that to understand it better to, um, to guide our actions. And, um, and these actions must uh, necessarily include both mitigation and adaptation. So, um, so we are already feeling the effects of uh, warming of the climate, and um, and so in in addition to looking at mitigation, uh, we need to think about uh, how human beings can adapt to the world that we're living in. Um, we absolutely need to accelerate progress on low and zero carbon energy technologies. Uh, we need to educate a new generation of. Um, leaders in climate energy and the environment. Uh, we, we need to um, share what we learn um, from others around the world and, um, and uh, the MIT community, we want to use our community as a, as a test bed for change. So we actually want to try, uh, try out some ideas and see what works and um, uh, and the, the most uh, the most useful ones um, offer them up as uh, as as being helpful approaches. Okay, so um, so going into now the five plan pillars to improve our understanding of climate change. Um, so we um, MIT provided some internal funds uh, for seed grants that we opened up to the MIT community, and we are also seeking outside support. So the, um, the health of the planet is one of the major um, aspects of MIT's campaign for a better world that we kicked off um, this past spring. Uh, on acceleration of progress on low and zero carbon energy technologies, uh, our energy initiative um, is starting a group of low carbon energy centers. Um, uh, several of them have already started, um, others will start in the near future and the idea behind these is that um, these are big enough problems that uh, the, um, the, the 
typical approach that Mighty has taken um, with a company teaming with uh, an investigator or a group of a small group of in investigators um, isn't going to get us to the answers to the questions that we need to know quickly enough. So we're um, forming um, groups of companies and individuals um, uh, working on topical problems um, such as carbon capture sequestration, um, solar um, storage, uh, the grid, uh, fusion, biofuels, uh, etc. And um, and um, we're we're thinking hard about participation from both uh, the developed world and um, and also considering um, the very special role of the developing world. So there's a a very low bar uh, for membership because we want to encourage um, entities from the developing world who um, who wouldn't necessarily have the resources to um, to join Mighty um, so that they can participate in these centers and and add their wisdom. Um, uh, we're also uh, starting study of the utility and mobility um, flight and uh, in the city of the future and um, and also um, considering um, the challenge of, uh, of two degrees and the kind of energy mix that's going to be necessary um, to, um, to address that challenge. On the education front, um, we've, uh, we've already secured support um, from, um, uh, uh, from uh, MIT alums um, on um, the caps and L's on a new miner for uh, environment and sustainability. We're very grateful to have uh, their support for that. Um, that miner is being planned and it will be going through the uh, MIT uh, committee structure um, this year to uh, to hopefully get approval so we can start that out. Um, there will be a new um, online MITx uh, climate change credential and the work is starting to take place um, to bring that to for, to fruition. Um, it will begin or be be based on um, there's already a very good online course on uh, on climate change um, from Kerry Emanuel and Professor Sarah Seeger. And, um, and so we'll be expanding additional offerings to contribute uh, to that. But we have a good, good basis for starting that. And then um, looking for other opportunities to embed sustainable principles um, throughout our curricula. So we've just, uh, our um, environmental solutions uh, people wrote um, a grant that was, uh, f that was uh, fully funded. And the idea is to um, develop modules and problem sets um, to add environment and sustainability into the existing um, general institute requirements. So instead of developing a new course, um, the courses that our um, freshmen already take when they come here, uh, everybody's looking for new problem sets in the GIRs. And, um, and so um, there are a number of faculty who teach these GIRs uh, who are teaming um, with ESI who are very excited about uh, infusing this content um, into those courses. And then share what we know and learn from others around the world. So um, we'll be developing seminars for policymakers and industry leaders, um, expanding the capacity of our climate collab. We've already had an alumni um, uh, um, a competition and uh, grateful for any of you who uh, have participated uh, in that. Uh, we are very close to going live on a new web portal on climate change where we'll be um, uh, providing updates and, uh, and providing um, information and then we're pursuing solutions through MIT's uh, SOLVE conference and, and there will in fact be uh, um, a module at the next SOLVE that, uh, that has uh, uh, a climate uh, climate aspects to it, which we can talk more about. And then use finally using our community as a test bed for change. Um, we are um, in process of reducing our campus emissions. We're eliminating the use of fuel oil in campus power generation. Uh, we have already enacted uh, 
uh, shadow pricing of carbon in our uh, capital improvement plans. So any capital improvement plan that we develop since we rolled out the climate action plan, we've been um, taking into account the uh, the carbon price of it. Um, we're we've, we're deploying an open um, data platform, and um, and we're also um, you know activating our um, campus as a living lab. Okay, and I guess. Uh, I guess that's it, and um, so I guess now I'm I'm ready to take questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Now I've got a. We're going to take some questions from the audience, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, we're gonna we're gonna jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question I have uh, is is of the five pillars that you mentioned. Uh, what do you think are the most most challenging for the institute to implement? So. Um, you know, so all all of the the pillars are um, you know have their own kind of flavor of challenge. Um, what what I actually think is the most uh, challenging thing that we have to face is um, is assessing that we're actually making progress and that the plan that we decided to undertake um, is uh, is effective or or more effective than other things that we could have done. Okay, so for example, um, you know, when we had a petition to divest of fossil fuels, and um, and we thought very very hard um, about divesting from fossil fuel companies, um, and um, and and there were a lot of opinions on that, and there was there was no single uh, uh, step that we could have taken or decision that we could have made. That would have uh, provided uh, come with a unanimity of opinion from the MIT community, and um, and um, we ultimately decided after a great deal of thought that um, MIT works with industry, um, and um, and that and also that fossil fuel companies. Um, which contain many of our alums, um, we're going to be central to actually solving the climate change problem. And in fact, uh, as I talk to uh, colleagues uh, who work in fossil fuel companies, you know, many of our alums go to these companies because they they feel like the biggest um, the the biggest contribution they can make towards solving climate change is to go to companies with big carbon footprints and working from within. And so we've decided that, uh, that the, the better approach for us was to work with these companies um, rather than distance ourselves from these companies. And, um, and we rejected the notion that you can divest these companies um, and still work with them um, because when we team with companies, it's a partnership. And um, and we've got to realize uh, that there are problems and that there are shared problems, and we need to work together for a solution. So um, so that uh, that course of action um, actually I think is on the basis of the feedback that we've gotten uh, is supported by the um, majority of of uh, people who have uh, responded um, to us, uh, but it didn't satisfy uh, everybody. And um, and so we um, you know we're going to be uh, uh, right justifiably I think asked to show that we're making progress um, by engaging with companies, and um, and so I think that's our um, that's our biggest challenge. Oh, excellent! Thank you for that response. I guess following up on the the theme of partnerships and progress. Um, mm -hmm. One of the questions that came in from the webinar was comparing the progress that universities versus that that one may see in the Washington D.C. area, um, i.e., our elected officials. And I wonder what what imp impact or influence you see universities having on the political decision making around climate change. Okay, so um, so so let me just say so I, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm I'm. Um, I'm MIT's federal officer, so I'm the person on the faculty side who is responsible for relationships in um, Washington. So I, I spend uh, at least a day a week in DC and um, 
and um, and talk to people. So, um, so the the climate problem, as you know, um, has become exceedingly politicized. Um, in um, in the 2008 election, actually, both parties had approximately the same point of view on climate change. Um, so, um, so it actually wasn't discussed much because there wasn't really any disagreement. In 2012, it was more polarizing, and um, and it was a third rail, so neither candidate went near it. And um, and now um, it's uh, it's become even more polarized, um, uh, although um, both candidates are talking about it. Uh, what I can say is that um, public opinion is changing very rapidly on this topic, and um, and um, so we, uh, you know, I am um, uh, the 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 Democrats are very supportive of action on climate change. The Republicans less so. Uh, we, we continue our discussions um, with the Republicans. Um, and um, and actually, no no Republican um, that I've asked to see to talk about uh, these issues um, has has actually ever turned me down um, for an appointment to come and um, and see them. And so um, so we we have discussions about um, well, let's just start with um, trying to address um, the matter of severe weather. Um, and um, uh, severe weather is a serious problem. It's a it's a consequence. Of uh, of the warming climate, um, but um, but we can start with that issue. Um, we uh, we talk about jobs. Um, you you know we can't talk about uh, you know if if we're going to be using less coal, uh, we need to start a conversation about um, getting better jobs for people who currently mine coal, and um, and so I I think if we take the conversation in these directions and we try to find common ground, um, we, have, um, we have a better chance of, uh, of making progress and I believe it's always better to be talking than not to be talking. Um, I can say that, um, that, that there, is, uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are forces on the Republican side um, that really see the writing on the wall here and, um, and I think you'll see next spring um, after the election um, that the uh, I think the Republicans will start um, talking about um, the issues of a carbon tax, um, and um, and I think it won't get anywhere politically, but uh, but I uh, we sense the uh, the desire for um, for them to start weighing in um, because uh, they they don't want this situation to get away from them, and uh, um, so. Um, so, uh, so I think see uh, some of that conversation starting next spring. Um, but like I said, you know, the 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 bottom line is um, public opinion is changing rapidly because people's lives are being affected um, from the effects of climate change, and um, and we're doing all we can to um, to have open conversations and to find areas of common ground um, to uh, to help us, you know, move this. Uh, move the solution to this problem ahead um, in the best way that we can. Thank you from that. Uh, and I'm going to try and paraphrase. A, a, we've got, you know, 30 questions already from the webinar participants. So wow. I'm going to try and, and, and paraphrase one. I think it sort of follows on that yeah. a discussion around public opinion. I, I understand the work that you're doing in the nation's capital, but, but given that this issue is, is so incredibly complicated and there's lots yeah. of uncertainty around it, what what if any efforts is the Institute undertaking as far as sort of public education or improving the scientific understanding of the general populace around this incredibly complex issue? Okay, well, I'll let me tell you something. There, there are a number of people um, uh, from outside MIT who, who told me, who have told me that the most important thing that MIT has done with its climate action plan is to get up and say publicly and loudly that climate change is a problem. Okay, um, we, um, We've also come out decisively 
and um, and advocated a uh, a price on carbon, and um, and so um, so those of you who are a, a member of this part of the alumni network um, you know, may not think that that's actually a big deal. Um, however, it is very difficult for us to make any statement on behalf of MIT, okay? Because we're we're speaking for everybody on campus plus our alumni network and we don't have a hundred percent consensus on anything so so for MIT to make a statement as an institution that climate change is a major problem um, causes us uh, to be um, speaking at odds with what a very small group of our uh, current staff and um, Current faculty and alumni think so. There, are, there are people out there um, who don't believe um, that this is a problem. Okay, and in fact, in response to the climate action plan, um, we had more responses from our community that climate change wasn't a problem, that that climate change isn't a problem, than we had people from our community who were disappointed that we didn't divest from fossil fuels. So, to me. Um, uh, uh, that was um, remarkable. Okay, um, so um, so there, you know, there, there. So when you, whenever we say something in, as an institution, we have people within our community says who say, um, "Well, I don't agree with that position, so you shouldn't be making a position like that." And if that was the case, um, we would never say anything. Okay, and um, and um, and we thought about this quite carefully. Um, I should say that I have spoken personally to hundreds of students, faculty, and alums. I've probably spoken to um, to a number of you at uh, at different occasions, um, and so um, so I feel like um, like I have a good sense of the range of opinions um, from our community, and. Um, and we decided that although we didn't have 100% agreement on it, that we had to make this uh, uh, statement. So, um, so we are out there. We are talking about it publicly. The president's talking about it. I'm talking about it. We're putting this web portal out. Um, we're going to be doing public events on it. We have made the health of the planet um, a pillar of our um, campaign. Um, so, um, so these are. Uh, the public things that we're going to be doing now. I mean, we are going to be offering short courses, um, etc. But um, but we're out there uh, talking about this um, quite prominently. Great. And and for alumni who want to maintain a level of interest or engagement, the the best place for them to go for for ongoing information about events would be. Yeah. Well, we, it's um it is a uh, it's 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 a uh, a website. It's it, it is going to be relaunched. It was it was out there during um uh, during the campus conversation, but it's it's going to be climateaction.mit.edu, and it will be coming up. Um, it will be coming up imminently. So um, so I, I want to express my appreciation to um, to all the alumni who weighed in um, during the during the conversation. Um, who weighed in um, afterwards and who and who have offered to help? Um, we have a a group of alumni who are um, you know volunteering to help us on campus sustainability. Um, they're looking at green jobs. Uh, they're looking at how they can help in the communication off campus. Um, in in our next uh, solve, our next MIT solve, we're going to have two new climate challenges: one on carbon pricing and um, and one on um, uh, mechanisms for actually taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and um, we're hoping to uh, to get uh, as much involvement as we can um, on that. Uh, um, and I, I really, you know, our our alumni uh, population is so incredibly talented that I hope a lot of you um, uh, will, um, you know, take the opportunity to weigh in on this. But um, but all the things that I've talked about, um, they're all going to be summarized on um, on that website. So that will be the the portal for you to um, to uh, to think about uh, how you can contribute. Great. Um, I've also got a, a couple of sort of fairly specific questions here. I'd like to to throw out. One is you mentioned carbon pricing most mm -hmm. recently, and then 
previously as, as well about shadow carbon pricing. Can you tell us a little more about that and what you've learned so far? Okay, so um, uh, so let's see. I will say that um, uh, we uh, we joined the carbon pricing uh, show. Um, this was um, uh, this is a a group of it was mainly uh, business organizations. MIT is the only the second. Um, university that has uh, been joined, but it's a it's a joint effort of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund um, that um, uh, meets uh, regularly uh, to come up for strategies about uh, how um, a carbon price uh, could be implemented. Um, we're um, we're also we also have an effort going on campus um, to uh, work with the airline industry um, to, uh, to think about um, pricing carbon in the airline um, industry because um, uh, I mean what we've been telling the airlines is um, you could be the next target of a divestment campaign um, uh, and um, you know clearly uh, emissions from airlines are um, are very critical um, in uh, in um, you know, in terms of the the growth of emissions, and um, and so we're um, we're working with them to educate them, and um, actually have a big uh, investor group uh, that's involved um, in that as well, um, who is uh, who is working with us, and and trying to convey that um, that we've got to um, start building in the real social price of carbon. Um, in order that we can get to a level playing field to allow the economics to work for clean solutions to be implementable. So in our, um, in our uh, shadow pricing um, on campus, um, our, um, our Office of Sustainability um, is you know, working with the facilities group um, on campus. Uh, all of these uh, groups report to uh, our executive vice president and treasurer, uh, Israel Ruiz, and um, and so when when we consider um, either building a new building or the renovation of a building, um, we build in um, the uh, we build in the price of carbon um, into it, and um, and of course that that we are we of course have a sustainability plan um, for um, for our campus, um, and um, and we we build that price in and it and it drives us. Um, to um, to choose solutions that are um, you know more um, energy efficient, um, uh, um, yeah, I guess that's it. That are that are more energy efficient. So so those you know we are carrying um, a uh, a price for carbon um, in uh, in our campus design. Thank you for that that question as well as that response. And then following on on the infrastructure theme, um, you mentioned that that carbon pricing is taken into account when you're in the the design phase or planning for infrastructure. What about current infrastructure and and any adaptation actions MIT has to take or is considering taking, given the fact that our campus is essentially at river level? Ah, oh, okay. Well, um, well, the the Office of Sustainability um, is. Um, is definitely planning um, uh, for uh, for adaptation, but I should I should speak um, more generally about uh, about what the Office of Sustainability is doing. So um, so the that group meets weekly, and they've they've published um, our first greenhouse gas um, inventory, and um, and uh, so we announced in the climate action plan that um, that we had a 32% um, goal to decrease emissions by 2030. Um, we we announced that 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 32% was a was a floor, not a ceiling, and that we were going to try to beat that. And we announced that we would provide a yearly update to the community on what we were doing. Now, um, now of course, uh, if 32% by 2030, if we stayed on that trajectory, uh, that would that would not be consistent with uh, limiting emissions to, uh, to a degree and a half, and so we need to do better than that, and um, and we intend to do better than that. Um, but we need to put out a baseline out there of what we're doing now, so that we can um, 
tasks and that we can actually assess uh, our progress. So we will um, we will be doing an update to that uh, inventory uh, in the fall, and and I should say um, that um, that um, while we're figuring out ways um, of uh, of how to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas footprint. Um, we are also, um, we have growing aspirations on the campus um, from uh, that require more energy use. For, so for example, we're, um, we're building um, a nano building, um, which uh, is, is going to be a lot of uh, high-tech equipment, um, which is going to basically be a, a building-wide clean room, which is going to have, uh, you know, air handling units blowing, um, blowing out air, which is going to be very energy intensive. Um, that building's going to be lead gold, so it's going to be the first time that a building of that kind um, is going to be lead gold. And so even with um, the growing aspirations of our researchers to do research that's energy intensive, um, we're, we're still um, making progress in reducing a carbon footprint. So, um, so there are a number of efforts associated with that. Um, efficiency improvements, um, building efficiency, um, you know, and um, and uh, just personal behavior. So although MIT is an, uh, you know, as an institution is taking all these steps, um, our president has asked um, each and every one of us, uh, both on campus and our alums, um, to be thinking about what they ought to be doing as individuals to contribute to this problem because human behavior is going to be, a, um, you know, has to be a part of the solution. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left, and, and there are a bunch of questions still um, on this. Uh, I'm going to try and okay. pick a couple at, at the end. W one is, one is um, there's a proposed 2016 conference on the ethical dimensions of the climate issue um, yeah. that was mentioned in the action plan. Can you give yeah. us a little more information about that, please? Sure. So this was um, actually this this the idea for this came from our fossil free students and um, and so um, they uh, asked if um, if we could uh, hold a conference on this topic. We're planning the the conference to occur uh, this fall, and we hope to have more ideas um, on that soon. Um, but um, so uh, I think some of the topics uh, that the um, the students are interested in covering is um, you know what is our collective responsibility to address climate change um, um, as well as our weighing our individual uh, actions versus our um, our collective responsibilities um, and um, and also thinking about how do we make this transition to um, a zero carbon energy system um, in a way that's fair and just. okay so um, so I think almost all of us will agree that we should stop burning coal, okay? But in parts of the world, and I'm thinking particularly of India, um, you know, by 2050, India is going to have another 400 million people, okay? So just between now and 2050, um, uh, India is going to have an additional population that's equal to the population of the United States, okay? And they need energy and they need inexpensive energy. So how do we tell them that they shouldn't have um, improved their quality of life the way we in the Western world have improved our quality of life and driven our, um, driven our economic competitiveness? So, um, so we, you know, we need to think carefully about what's the, um, the ethical way to solve the climate problem um, and also to be, uh, to be fair um, and just to our growing population. So, so please stay tuned for that. When we when we do that, we certainly are going to webcast it. Excellent, um, and we look forward to that. Thank you. Um, there, there are a couple questions here about about entrepreneurs and startups and and new technologies and and how is how is MIT engaging with that community and supporting the development of of, of clean tech in this space? Can you? Talk to that for a minute or two. Okay, sure. Yes, absolutely. So, um, so, um, so we, um, uh, you know, we are amplifying um, our efforts um, to uh, to link to the entrepreneurial 
um, community. So, um, so we're you know we're doing um, a development project um, in Kendall Square, and um, uh, you know that um, I, I think you're, there'll be an announcement on this uh, this fall that will have um, more specifics. Um, but we are um, certainly uh, looking at um, at what steps we could be taking um, to take the ideas that emerge um, on campus um, and actually from um, off campus as well, um, our, our alums and beyond, and, um, and what are, um, how, how we could be helping them um, take the ideas that, that they have for clean energy and to, um, to move them along a path um, where they can be developed um, and commercialized, and so um, so the idea of uh, um, um, you know making space um, available in the vicinity um, of the university where we have um, an ecosystem is a major part of it. We're also working um, you know with uh, the city of Boston and the Chamber of Commerce and those communities um, to increase uh, increase those ties. So, um, so you'll be seeing um, you'll be seeing a lot more on that uh, in the coming months. All right. Well, that that's great, and we've actually um, we've managed to run out of time. So, uh, thank you, Professor Zuber, and thank you, webinar participants. Uh, the webinar is now going to close. We will uh, keep you up to date on future developments and opportunities for alumni engagement. So, please pay attention to your emails. Uh, finally. We encourage your participation in the upcoming Alumni Leadership Conference in September, where some of these issues are going to figure prominently. So uh, stay tuned for that, and we look forward to your ongoing participation. Again, thanks for being here today. Have a good rest of the day. Uh, we are adjourned. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.